Hello, this is a summary of an article on the concept of Mahdi in 12 Shiism in the Encyclopedia Iranica, dating from 2012. The author of the article is Muhammad Ali Amir Muezzi. I have provided a brief summary of Professor Amir Muezzi's academic work in another video I made on one of his Iranica articles on the Shia doctrine. So I would refer you to that video for those details. I'll give the link to the video below. For those of you not familiar with it, let me also highly recommend the Encyclopedia Iranica. It is a superb collection of articles on all aspects of Iranian history and culture and is conveniently accessible online. Before I begin, let me say that this is only my summary of someone else's work. So if you have any substantial questions about the article, it is better to take them up with the author directly. The article is available online, so I encourage you to read it for yourself. Obviously, you will have to refer to the article if you want to look at the author's source materials. So to the article, which I encourage you to read. Mahdism in 12 Shiism inherited many of its elements from previous religious trends. Islamic eschatology, apocalypticism, messianism owe many of their doctrines and elements to Zoroastrianism, Manichaeanism, Judaism and Christianity. But even without going back that far, we can think of numerous Shi and non-Shi sects that existed prior to the definitive transition from earlier Imamism to Twelver Shiism in the first half of the 10th century, which were influential. Overviewing the contribution of these borrowed elements helps us to better appreciate their historical development within Twelver Shiism. So let's now look at the crisis of AH260, uh, AD 874. According to the traditional date, the 11th Imam, Imam Hassan Askari, died in 874 AD. Like that of previous Imams, his death gave rise to a period of turbulence among the faithful. But this time the crisis seemed even more serious, and the Imamis did not themselves hesitate to call the decades that were to follow the period of perplexity or the period of confusion. A key issue was the mysterious fate of the Imam's presumed son, which led to several schisms. Some groups claimed that his son had already died, either at a very young age or later, whilst others simply denied the very existence of a son. A small minority, however, believed that the son of the 11th Imam was still alive, existing in occultation, and that he would reappear at the end of time as the Mahdi, the guided one. Eventually this idea came to be adopted by all Imamis, who thus became known as Twelvers. Sources from this period suggest that there was a prolonged period of hesitation and crisis before this consensus was reached. The first certain textual support for what came to be agreed upon came to be the agreed upon list of twelve Imams only dates to after what would be termed the minor occultation. It is only from Khulaini's hadith collection onwards that traditions regarding the modern definitive number of imams and the occultation of the 12th imam became more frequent. Uh, I should say Khulaini died in 940-41. And it is of note that some of these traditions came from very diverse sources, including those who believed that there had been only five or seven or eleven imams, uh, the last one in each case having been the hidden Mahdi. Nor was there initial agreement as to the nature of occultation, the hidden imam existing either in a spiritual state or continuing as a secret lineage. The theorization of the concept of occultation began in the 10th century and became more pronounced in the 11th. There were also uncertainties about the belief in the delegation from the Imam and the four delegates or deputies of the hidden Imam. All this suggests that the Imami community experienced a serious identity crisis during this period. 
doctrines about the authority and legitimacy of the 12th Imam had to be worked out, and despite resistance, were eventually established as articles of faith. This was not a smooth transition from Imami Shiism to 12th Shiism, however. In this confused atmosphere, schisms grew in number. Adversarial movements, particularly the Ismailis, undoubtedly benefited from the situation, and there were a significant number of Shi'is who abandoned its ranks. Finally, by the time Sheikh Fusi wrote his Kitab al Geba, a substantial monograph on the subject in the early 11th century, the Articles of Faith regarding the Mahdi of the Twelve Rashis appeared to be well established, that is, that the son of the 11th Imam is indeed the 12th and final Imam, and that he had two occultations. During the first and much shorter one, he communicated with believers through the intermediary of four delegates. During the second, which is to last until the end of time, he remains providentially living in his physical body in order to return to save the world as Mahdi. Versions of what would eventually be considered 12 orthodoxy began to emerge in the first half of the 10th century, but only attained their definitive form in the 11th. The eschatological saviour of Imamism is presented as Abu Qasim Muhammad ibn Hassan al Asghari, 12th and last among the Imams. He therefore bears the same name and Konya as the Prophet, thus fulfilling a hadith that undoubtedly relates to Mahdar's rebellion in favour of Muhammad ibn al Hanafiya, son of Ali, who was also uh, at the time regarded as the Mahdi. Note that there was an early belief that the actual name of the Mahdi should not be uttered in order to protect him from the Abbasid court. Thus, he was often referred to by one of his other titles, Muntaza, the awaited one, Sahib as Zaman, Lord of the Time, Al Qa'ib, the occulted or hidden one, Hujatullah, proof of God, Sahib al Amr, Lord of the Cause, Bagiatullah, the remainder of God, and most often, Ba'im, a complex term meaning, among other things, the standing, one who stands up, one who rises, the resurrector. This latter title, which among the Imamis gradually replaced that of Mahdi, was employed by Shi circles to designate the Imam who stood up to fight against unjust and legitimate, illegitimate power. In this sense, it contrasted with Qa'ed, literally the seated one, a term designating previous Imams who did not participate in rebellious movements against the Umayyad and Abbasid rulers. There are various accounts as to his mother. Most likely she seems to have been an African slave woman to whom various names are given, but in an alternative and, according to the author, undoubtedly legendary account, she was the granddaughter of the Byzantine emperor with an elaborate and hagiographic backstory. In any case, signs of the mother's pregnancy as well as the birth of the child were miraculously concealed, since the Abbasids sought to eliminate unexpected child whom persistent rumours described as a saviour. The date most often cited for his birth is the 15th of Shaban, 256, that is the 18th of July, 870, uh, one of the most important Imami festivals. The 11th Imam, then under Abbasid surveillance, in the military camp at Samara, showed his newborn son to some 40 close disciples before the child was hidden, with various ruses being adopted to ensure continued secrecy. Unsurprisingly, this concealed birth came to be identified as one of the distinctive signs of the Saviour. Like previous Imams, the Mahdi was credited with a birth and childhood bathed in the miraculous, Supernatural signs, divine lights, and celestial messengers accompanied him from his very birth. He demonstrated initiatory knowledge and manifested supernormal powers. Next, upon the death of his father in AH 260, that's 874 in the Western calendar, the 12th Imam entered his first occultation, 
whilst still a child, a period later termed the Minor Occultation, which lasted 70 lunar years, that is, until uh, 329 in the Hegira 940 uh, Anna Domini. Uh, during this period, the hidden Imam is said to have communicated with his believers through four intermediary delegates or representatives. These men ensured that canonical precepts were respected by the believers and religious taxes collected and distributed. They also delivered questions of a religious nature to the hidden Imam, making his responses known in, to the public and performing miracles to reassure the faithful. Finally, in 329 of the Hedra, 940 uh, AD, the fourth and last delegate received the last letter signed by the hidden Imam, in which he declared that henceforth, and until the end of time, no one would see him or be his representative, and that whosoever declared otherwise was an impostor. This marked the beginning of the second, or major, occultation, uh, which, according to Twelver Shi doctrine, still continues after more than a thousand years, and will last until the eschatological return of the Mahdi. According to early Imami traditions, there are four principal reasons for the occultation. First, to safeguard the life of the hidden Imam. Second, to ensure independence from the temporal powers and their un injustice until the return of the Mahdi. Third, to test believers in order to measure the degree of their faith. And finally, a secret reason not to be revealed until the end of time. Amir Moezi notes that the concept of two occultations originated earlier in the beliefs of the Waqafis of the seventh Imam, Musa al Qasim, uh, that is, those who believed that he was the final Imam. Again, belief in the delegation of four official representatives of the hidden Imam during the first occultation seems to have started to take form long after the proclamation of the major occultation, most likely in the second half of the 10th century. Indeed, according to one, recent, one researcher, uh, the dogma of delegation to the Imam by a sole representative seems to have been invented and spread by the powerful Nobahti family in Baghdad, one of whose members, Hussein Ibn Ruh Nobahti, uh, was declared to be the third of his representatives. One feature of the major occultation uh, was strengthened faith in the invisible presence of the hidden Imam, expressed particularly in visionary meetings with him. Accounts of such experiences span almost a thousand years, it being understood that such meetings did not entail the devotee becoming a representative of the Imam in any, in any form due to the encounter. Although such encounters could occur anywhere, they were more likely in the city of Mecca, or beside the Imam's mausoleum, any of the Imam's mausoleums, uh, or the cave uh, in Samara, where the hidden Imam is said to have begun his occultation, the mosque of Sahla in Najaf, and the sanctuary of Jamkaran, not far from Qum. Uh, these meetings expressed the hidden Imam's concern for the well-being of his followers, his ability to teach them prayers and to transmit spiritual knowledge and secrets to them and to prompt believers uh, individual spiritual regeneration. So now let's turn to the end of time and the rising of the Mahdi. The end of time is the date of the final advent of the Ibn Imam. It is unknown and believers are urged to await deliverance. Uh, patiently and piously. This coming is heralded by a number of signs. The universal signs are the widespread invasion of the earth by evil, the overcoming of knowledge by ignorance, and the loss of a sense of the sacred and all that links man to God and his neighbours. These, in some measure, require the manifestation and rising of RM, or else humanity will be overwhelmed by darkness. Furthermore, there are certain specific signs particularly the coming of the Sufiani, the enemy of Qa'im, who will command an army in battle against the latter, the advent of Yamani, who appears in the Yemen to preach support for the Qa'im, 
the cry or scream of supernatural origin coming from the sky and calling man to defend the imam's cause, the swallowing of an army composed of the imam's enemies in a desert, often located in tradition between Mecca and Medina from uh, an early hadith, um, and the assassination by the Meccans of the messenger to the Qa'im. The Mahdi thus becomes manifest, all the while having miraculously maintained his youth. He fights and definitively uproots evil and pervasive ignorance, re-establishing the world to its original pure state. He will not only re-establish Islam, but all religions to their purity and original integrity, making submission to God a universal religion. He will also bring wisdom to mankind by revealing the esoteric secrets of sacred scriptures. For all this to occur, he must first avenge the assassination of Imam Hussein in order that the majority of Muslims be purged of the most villainous crime that is ever committed. In the final battle against the forces of evil, the Qa'em is not alone. According to the eschatological doctrine of Raja, a certain number of past saints, victims of their community's injustice and their persecutors come back to life in order that the good may take revenge on the evil ones. Furthermore, the Qa'em will be accompanied by certain sacred historical characters, including Jesus, the Prophet Muhammad, and various of the Imams. His army will include the 313 angels that accompanied the 313 fighters from the Battle of Bad between the Prophet and the Meccans, and most importantly, 313 companions of Qa'im, initiated disciples who bear secret knowledge and possess miraculous powers who form his personal militia. There will also be a terrifying celestial entity named Fear uh, who marches at the head of the Mahdi's army and terrifies his enemies. After the triumph of the Mahdi, the entire world will be brought to submission. The forces of injustice and ignorance will once and for all be exterminated, the earth embellished with justice and wisdom, and humanity revived by knowledge. The Mahdi thus prepares the world for the ultimate trial of the final resurrection of the Last Judgment. According to some traditions, he will reign upon the earth for some time, maybe seven, nine or nineteen years, after which occurs the death of all humanity just prior to the Last Judgment. Other traditions report that after the death of the Qa'im, the government of the world will remain in the hands of the initiated for a certain period before the Day of Resurrection. Now let's turn to the questions of influence and consequences. Unlike in Sunnism, where belief in the Mahdi or the present never became an essential article of faith, in Shiism in general, and further Imamism in particular, it is made a constitutive dogma of its religious doctrine, its dualist vision of the world, and more specifically its conception of the Ma'ad, the place of return or the hereafter. Over time, Imami literature dedicated to the hidden Imam tried hard to demonstrate that the figure of the Mahdi, uh, also present in Sunni hadith, referred to the 12th Imam. Imami arguments gained support during the 13th century from several major Sunni scholars. As this support coincided with the arrival of the Mongols, the end of Sunni caliphal power, and the increasing political influence of the Imamis, we might suspect an element of opportunism in this doctrinal reversal. Whatever the case, from this time onwards, some learned Sunnis occasionally rallied to Imami Mahdism. This development was also noticeable among some Sunni mystics, including the 19th century Naqshbandi master from Balkh, uh, Suleiman Konduzi. It's also of note that some doctrinal issues regarding the person of the 12th Imam, his occultation, his final advent, his companions, and accounts of encounters with him have been interpreted in terms of spiritual and esoteric hermeneutics in the Imami mystic, mystical schools and texts, particularly amongst the Sheikhis 
and nematolites. So, thank you for listening, and in particular, many thanks to my patrons, Ian Palin and Tricia Williams. If you like this video, you're welcome to subscribe to my channel. Uh, if you want to support the development of the channel, you can do so through Patreon or PayPal. I'll give details below uh, the video. You can also click the like button so that I can get an idea which of my videos are of greatest interest to viewers. Have a good day.